I believe as believers, we are supposed to be filled to overflowing at all times. Acts 19, verse 1, you can read with me. It says this, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. You think you're in bad shape. These guys haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it a blessing when somebody comes to declare to you something you don't know? Think about how radically their life is about to be changed. They hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. How many people did they talked to that knew about the Holy Spirit that didn't share with them about the Holy Spirit? There's an interesting question for you. These guys were disciples in Ephesus. Ephesus, as we know, was one of the largest churches, ended up being one of the largest churches in the New Testament. And they hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, what were they doing in Ephesus? <laughs> Just a thought. So he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? <laughs> Could you hear Paul saying that? Well, then what were you baptized into? And so they said, into the John's baptism. And then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, everyone said laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with new tongues and prophesied. And now the men were about 12 in all. Now it's astonishing to me to read that. And to look at the state of the church today and how little of this we do as a body. Don't be talking to me about the Holy Spirit because I might not come back to your church next week. Okay. Well, then you may not. Because at Life Song, we talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, why would you do that? He, I don't see you know, Because it's talked about in the Bible. Over and over and over and over again. And it's just interesting to me how in the modern day movement, we've become, <laughs> we've locked the Holy Spirit into the room lest he come out and scare somebody away. I've told you this before. A lot of people look at, anybody have like the weird uncle that would come to the family reunions, you know, and you're like, oh no, the weird uncle's here. We're lucky if he's sober, first and foremost. And second of all, he's just kind of weird. He's awkward, and, you know, you get stuck with the weird uncle, and you're looking for an escape. and Because you, you don't really know the weird uncle, but you know he's part of your family, so you've got to be nice to him. But everybody doesn't want to hang out with the weird uncle, right? Well, I believe a lot of people in the church today look at the Holy Spirit as the weird uncle. They're not real comfortable with him. They don't want him to do anything crazy, Right? So you know what? What a lot of churches have done is that we've just locked him in a room and said, don't come out of there unless we really need you. Stay put because we don't want you scaring people off, right? And we have, <laughs> could be why I only got, you know, 80 people in my church, but hey, that's okay. I want 80 believers. <laughs> but we formulated our church services so much that the Holy Spirit, if he does want to move, doesn't have any place to move. And we don't want him messing up the flow of our service because this is the way that we can get a lot of people here each and every week. Isn't it interesting that Paul wasn't interested in making sure these guys came back to his church next week. He was just ready to lay hands on them. He was ready to go after it and to and do the power of the Holy Spirit on them. Let me just read to you what I wrote down here. Notice here that Paul is not interested in being politically correct. He is not worried about offending someone. He is not interested in making sure that he makes those he, ad he is addressing comfortable so that they might come back next week. He is concerned with one thing, and that is making disciples of Christ. He is interested in what Jesus instructed us to do, which was to go forth making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul was interested in transformation. He was interested in a pouring out from heaven that would bring radical change to those who would believe the gospel. Let me ask you this morning, what are you interested in? 
Are you ready to lay hands on those who need life transformation? Are you interested in a real authentic move of God upon which no one can deny the reality of the power of God? See, we look at the New Testament and we say, man, it would be so great to see these manifestations. We can, church. But the problem is, is that most of the church is running on empty. They're not filled up to overflowing. You see, the reason that Paul was ready to lay hands on someone is because he was filled up with the power of the Holy Spirit. He said (laughs) in, in Corinthians, I pray in tongues more than all of you. That's what he said. It's, you can go see it. He said, I wish that all of you would pray in tongues. He said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. He was consistently being filled up with the power of God. He was in a one-on-one personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. He wasn't afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit. No, he knew that the power of the Holy Spirit is what fueled him to go out and to make radical disciples of Christ. See, Paul was interested in building something that would last and something that would change the world. He could care less about consumerism. He could care less about what was cool. He could care less about what was trendy and happening. No, he wanted to see the Holy Spirit change people radically because those people could then go and change the world. That's what Jesus did. If you look at Jesus' ministry, whenever a crowd would begin to gather around him, he would get nervous. Wouldn't he? Remember that? When the crowd came around him, he said, well, okay, there's all these people, so what can I say to freak them out? All right, hey, you, you can't follow me unless you're willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood. How's that? It says many departed that day. <laughs> Good luck with all that, man, right? And then he looked at his disciples, the 12 that he had, and he said, what about you? You hanging out? Right? Time after time after time, Jesus would draw the line in the sand. You remember the rich young ruler that came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, you got to obey all of the laws of the command. He said, I've done this since I was born. In other words, I've been perfect. And then Jesus hit him where it hurts and said, then go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And it said that he left that day very sorrowful. Why was he sorrowful? Because he couldn't do it. Didn't have it in him. But yet, within our church, today, the modern-day believer is barely making it by. Their tank is so empty spiritually, they wouldn't know the power of the Holy Spirit if it came up and bit them in the face. It's the truth. You go and you read some of John G. Lake's books and some of the great ministers of old, Smith Wigglesworth, some of these guys, we're talking that saw incredible moves of God. The one thing that they all said was the most vital to their ministry and their life was their relationship and their communion with the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe it was Smith Wigglesworth that said, if I have to minister for an hour, I pray in the Spirit for three. He would double his preparation time in the power of the Holy Spirit before he would go and minister. And you say, well, that's a minister. You know, he's called. No, that's for everyone. Think about the power that we could have in our churches if we all came in here each and every week, prayed up, filled of the power of the Holy Spirit, ready to go. I've told you this before. We could hit worship running and just build from there. Instead of having to like build up our faith and kind of shake the world off of us and all that stuff, you know, because I see it on some of our faces and I understand the world's a, it's a it's a brutal place, but we come dragging in and it's and I've talked to you about my job as the worship leader to kind of pick you up off of the floor and get you into a place of belief and expectancy so that I can deliver a word to you that would change your life. But how much better, church, if we came in here pumped up, full of the Holy Spirit, ready to go, we could just launch. Amen. What are you interested in? Are you ready to lay hands on those who need life transformation? Are you interested in a real authentic move of God upon which no one can deny the reality of the power of God? You see, I'm certain this morning that one of the reasons that believers still struggle so mightily in their lives to see complete victory and transformation is because we, as a body, as a church, have locked the power of the Holy Spirit into a closet unless he come out and scare all the people away. 
I think we struggle because we are not coming into contact with this power on a daily, continual basis. We are filled up just enough on Sundays to make us feel happy. Because I'm happy. (laughs) But we are not feeling ourselves to overflowing with the power of heaven day in and day out. So that when the opportunity arises for us to lay hands on those who need power, or we come into a place where we need to exercise the power over the enemy, we have nothing in the tank. (laughs) When you wake up in the morning, does the devil go, oh no, he's awake? (laughs) That's what I want. We're about to talk about that here in just a minute. But I want, when I get up, the devil go, oh no, (laughs) he's back. He's at it again. That guy gets filled up with the power of the Holy Spirit, and he kicks my tail all day long from Sunday to Sunday. Can't wait for him to go back to sleep. Give me a break for a few minutes so I can go and have my way. We are called to be filled. Amen. Let me just read to you some things that Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He said, in John seven thirty seven through 39, he said, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But at this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given Because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, it's not supposed to be a stream. It's not supposed to be like a faucet just barely dripping, you know, little drops of the Holy Ghost. No, he said rivers, gushing rivers of living water flowing out of his heart. You know, you can just get around people and know those who have been in the presence of the Holy Spirit on a continual basis. It flows out of them. I've said that to people before. I said, I can tell you pray. Well, how can you tell that? Because I can feel it. I can see it in you. I want to brag on Debbie's dad, Mike. I remember the first night he walked into prayer. And like he said, they're not members of our church. They just come to prayer on Friday nights. And they came into prayer, and he started to pray, and it was just like I went, whoa. I didn't know who he was. I was like, who are you? Where did you come from? Where do you go? What do you do? You could just tell there was just an abundance that began to come out of his heart and his spirit. When he prayed, he prayed with authority. He prayed with power, and the room was filled with the presence of God. Why? Because he spends continuous time in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, communing with the Holy Spirit, making himself attentive to the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the same way. He was led by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he could do the things that he did. It was not just him on his own. It was him filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We saw that he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized because the Spirit came and descended down upon him like a dove. He was baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had to have that dunamis power before he could begin to enter into his ministry full bore. Jesus himself knew the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but yet we live life thinking that we can just get by. One verse a day, we break out our, our <laughs> we break out our verse a day calendar. If you have a verse a day calendar, that's cool, you know, just don't let it be your only source of word, please, I'm begging you. But we do, and we go over and we go read the verse of the day, we might even Facebook it. Facebook our verse of the day, sin. All right, off we go to work, and then we come dragging in at the end of the day, beat up from the devil, just wore out, tired. Don't ever look at the Word again. Don't fellowship with the power of the Holy Spirit. Didn't crack the Bible, didn't pray, didn't commune with Him, and we wonder why the devil's just having a heyday in our lives. We wonder why he's running all up and down us, because there's no power. Amen? What do you mean, power? Well, Jesus said it in Luke 24, 49. He said, Behold, I send the promise. Everyone say the promise. If Jesus called it the promise, it must be an important promise. To Jesus, it was the promise. I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are what? Endued with power from on high. I've talked to you about that word power before and what it means. It's dunamis power, which means 
power straight from the throne of God. Hmm. See, most people aren't willing to tarry. What did they have to do? They had to tarry in the city of Jerusalem. They had to wait on God. They had to pray. They had to get together in fellowship. They had to slow their world down for just long enough to receive the promise. See, I believe God has a ton available for us, but we're in such a hurry. I mean, I'm even right now, I'm preaching under the pressure of the fact that it's 1126 because I know in about four minutes, 50% of us are going to go to sleep. Not literally, but you'll just get tired. I feel it in you, in the spirit. I do. It's so funny. I feel it when it's like, okay, i got to stop. because these. Be- but, you know, you got in the New Testament, you got the Apostle Paul preaching all night long. <laughs> We're not willing to tarry anymore. I see it each and every week with our prayer and the attendance of prayer. It started off really strong, man. We had like 30 people coming every Friday night. And now we're like eight. And that's okay. I'll keep praying with eight. Because eight will get something done. If eight come in here with faith and ready to go. Amen. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Let me just preach at you for a minute. Is that all right? All right. I mean, hey, you come to prayer or not, I don't care. I'll be here. I remember Pastor Wally. Everybody knows Pastor Wally from Orchard Road Christian Center, one of my fathers. He was on his way to prayer one night. It was snowing like the dickens, and he was just saying, there's not anybody going to be at prayer. I should just cancel prayer. This is silly. And Jesus said, I'll be there. (laughs) Needless to say, we never canceled anything at Orchard Road Christian Center. Ever! But it's the truth. We're not willing to tarry. We're not willing to take some time out. And shut things down for a minute. And get into the power of God. Jesus went on to say this. Acts 1.5. He said, but you shall receive power. Everyone say power. power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. And all of Judea and Samaria. And to the ends of the earth. You think he thought the Holy Spirit was pretty important? The Apostle Paul said this, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What does he fill you with? The power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Apostle Paul was just praying that maybe your eyes would be open to the radical glory that is available to you. That's what he was praising for, praying for the church of Ephesus right there in Ephesians. He was saying, I just pray that you might get a little bit of a glimpse of what's available to you in the power that has been given to you through Christ Jesus. Just a little bit. Father, open the eyes of their heart. I pray that for you all the time because why? I don't want to guilt you into it. I don't want to make you feel bad. No, I want you to say, there's something out there for me. There's something bigger. There's something more. There's something greater. I want you to be hungry for it because when you're hungry for it, then you'll search for it. You'll plug in you'll get after it amen that's what Paul was praying for this church he's like I just pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you would know the richness of his glory the greatness of his power towards those who believe in other words I just wish that you could get an idea of what is available to you through the power of the Holy Spirit let me just translate that for you amen Paul's prayer does not describe a people whose tank is on empty. (laughs) This does not describe a people who have filled themselves with everything the world has to offer with no hunger for the things that God has to offer. 
Church, it's time to fill our tank. Well, what happens when our tank is filled? Well, let's read on and you'll find out in Acts 19. You'll get a little bit of an idea of someone walking with their tank full and what happens when these people walk with their tank full. First and foremost, let's look in verse 8 and it says, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. You see, when our tank is filled, we will preach the gospel with boldness. And endurance. Three months he hung out there. He never tired. With what kind of boldness? Strong boldness. Strength in his heart. Unashamed. You see, when your tank is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's funny how the timidity and the ashamedness of the gospel begins to melt away. Because it becomes alive to you becomes real. It's more than just a religion. Blah. We have enough religions out there. Religions start wars. Religions kill people. Religions blow up buildings. Religions, they rob from the poor and take to the rich. Religions are gross. Jesus was not about religion. He was about relationship. Relationship transforms. Relationship knows God. Relationship lights your heart on fire. Relationship wants to tell other people about what you're experiencing. You know, come on, ladies. When you met that special someone in your life, you never tired of talking about him, did you? <laughs> Some of you have been married for a long time are laughing. Yeah, but we do now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> tired of him right now. Hey, man, I know I was in youth ministry, youth ministry for years. I would hear you ladies talk, okay? And it was just like, oh, he's just so wonderful. You didn't care who it was. You were telling everybody about the guy that you'd met and how awesome he is and how he just talks to you the right way and he dresses so good and he smells so pretty and he treats you so right. You know, there's no wrong he can do. He took me out over here the other night and now he's taking me over here and we're doing this and we're doing that. Why? Because... There was something happening on the inside of you. There was a relationship that was developing. There was a love that was being ignited within your heart, and you could just tell anybody about it. How much more should we sow with Jesus Christ? And what happens is that when we're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, when we are in communion with him, that love is kindled, that fire is sparked, and all of a sudden it's like, man, you don't know what Jesus just did for me. You don't know how he talks to me, the way he treats me, the way he leads me, the promises that he has for me. He never fails me. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. And it's more than just saying it. You feel it. You know it in your gut. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is flowing out of you with rivers of living water. And people are just like, man, he's a Jesus freak. You're like, yeah, no, it's great. You don't want to stop. It's just too much. Because why? You're filled. You're filled up. It's time to fill our tanks. Amen. What else happens? Well, let's read on. Acts 19, 11 says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Yeah. What do you want for your church, Pastor Aaron? I want that. I want that, Lord Jesus. Why? Because the world's not seeing it. At least not any churches that I know in this town. You know, there's no greater testimony of the reality of Christ than signs and wonders. And just so you know, I say over myself each and every day, I got this from Charles Caps, <laughs> that as I follow Jesus, I will cast out demons, I will speak in new tongues, and I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I begin to say that over myself. Why? Because I'm proclaiming the promise of God for me. And Jesus said, and we're going to see that here in just a minute when we close, that this was the promise of those who would follow him. Come on now. See, in Life Song, I'm developing and desire to develop a church where the sick are lined up outside because they know if they get into this place, people will lay hands on them and they will recover. 
demons are being cast out of people. You know, I think counseling is good, and you should go to counseling. But you know what? Jesus didn't do much counseling. He did a lot of laying on of hands. Most of his counseling happened after people were in their right mind. Think about the man who was filled with a legion of demons, right? I love that story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I can't wait to sit down with him, the guy who had the demons, and say, what did you and Jesus talk about after all the demons were gone? But remember, Jesus walks up on this man. You remember this story? And this guy comes at him, and he's like, he's been sent out of his homeland. Because they couldn't control him. He was so filled with demons that there was no control. They didn't know what he was doing. He cut himself. Remember this? He was miserable. They tried to put chains on him, and the demons were so strong, he'd just break the chains. And so they had to put him out into the caves. I mean, think about the loneliness and the isolation of this man that he was experiencing of no fault of his own. He was possessed with demons. And Jesus walks up onto him. What's the first thing Jesus does? Cast the demons out of him. He didn't say, let me invite you in my cell group. My pastor will pray for you. You need to come to my church. No. He said, come here. Come here. And matter of fact, the demons saw him coming. (laughs) Because he was so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, they said, oh, no, no. We know who you are. Remember, they started begging for him. They said, well, don't just send us out. Let us go into those pigs over there. You know, Jesus here is negotiating. The demons are trying to strike a deal with Jesus. I love it. And so he's like, yeah, go into the ditch. So they take the, you know, the pigs and they run off the side of the hill and he's free. And then it says that all the people came from the town to see what had happened. And they found the man and Jesus is sitting by the fire in discussion. Oh, that's what I want to know about. See, then Jesus started to counsel. Cast the demons out, then started to counsel. I believe that many people could be delivered in the church if we would just get back to moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. We would spend a lot less time on counseling and a lot more time on ministry. Again, I'm not saying counseling is bad. If you're a counselor, counsel away, man. We need counselors. We do. That's a good thing. Don't hear that wrongly. What I'm saying is this, is that I think we've placated. Because of the dismissal of the power of the Holy Spirit, we've had to counsel more. Can I get an amen? It's true. What happened with that man of the demon? Did you know that Jesus left that place, told him to go and preach the gospel, and when Jesus came back to that place, that there were masses who believed in Christ. He went out and evangelized like crazy, told what God had done for him. Why? Because he was filled. Amen. All right. It's time to fill our tanks. What else will happen when we have our tanks filled? Well, let's take a little bit further look. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, <laughs> that's a title, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said... <laughs> Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man in whom the, Holy, the, Holy, the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they would fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> they got their butts kicked. All right. I don't mean to laugh, but it's true. See, when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the demons know your name. He said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but you ain't nothing, brother. I own you. That's what he was saying. Let me just bring it in modern day terms. Again, like I said, when you wake up in the morning, the devil says, oh, no, he's away. She's away. When your tank is filled, you will not, everybody say, I will not be overpowered. See, these people weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. They didn't know Jesus. They they were saying the name of Jesus without any relationship, without any submission to him, without any uh, continual feeling from him. There was no power behind it. They weren't filled, so therefore they were overpowered. But when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then the King of kings and the Lord of lords is the one who sees you through. And that's why they knew Paul. That's why they knew Jesus. They will know you as well, and you can say in the name of Jesus. 
and there is power behind it. You will not be overcome, overpowered. Let's put that into your personal lives. If you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you will walk in your own personal lives with more authority. I was 20 years old, and we were at a retreat with Mike Donahue. You know Mike, you hear him preach here. And there was a young lady who came on this retreat, and she was sleeping in a coffin. And she was wearing vials of blood around her neck. She brought her coffin with her to retreat. It was quite interesting. So we knew that there might be something <laughs> that's not all on the status quo there, all right? But this was the beauty of Mike. Mike didn't care about her coffin. He told her to put it in the sanctuary and sleep in it. <laughs> because that's what she wanted to do. And she's like, and he said, yeah, absolutely. Put it right there. No problem. He loved her. He welcomed her because he knew that his God was greater than hers. And we're Friday night. Worship's going. People are lifted hands high. And the Holy Spirit's flowing and moving throughout the place. And all of a sudden, Mike comes up to me and grabs me and says, have you ever cast out a demon before? And I said, no. And he says, you're about to. Come with me. So we go into this room, all right, this back room. And here is this girl on the floor, literally writhing and rolling around. Once we had started worship, the demon manifested that was in her. See, some of you guys look at me like, you're great. This stuff happens, right? It's not just in the movies. It's for real. And so we began, I, you know, I, whoa, what's going on here? I'm just newly converted again. Now I had the seeds of the word in my heart, but I also knew that God was able. I knew that he was powerful. I knew by the power of the Holy Spirit, this thing did not have any authority, no power. And so we began to pray, and this thing was talking to us, and it was not her. It was something else talking to us because the voice changed. It was crazy. But Mike had no fear. He basically just took his hands and laid it on her and said, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her right now. And immediately, bang, peace just fell over her body. Now, we were prayed up, ready to go. Did you know that girl that night was delivered of all that demonic activity? She got saved, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. God radically changed her life that weekend. She left the coffin at breakthrough. She took the vials of blood off of her neck, and she left differently. See, when you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, when your tank is going on, people will be miraculously delivered. Amen. Let's read on. What a Last thing, X 19.20, it says this, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. You see, when our tank is filled, church, when we are in constant communion with the Holy Spirit, when we are being filled up with the rivers of living water each and every day, the word of the Lord will grow mightily and it will prevail. There is no other way that it can happen, that we have to be filled. The body, the church of God needs to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit on a more continuous basis. Amen. I told you this a couple weeks ago, but um, a gentleman came to men's meeting not too long ago, and they're doing a revival in, in one of the parks here, and the view of Denver is now that this is the darkest place in America because of all of the stuff that's been going on here, and people are like, you're crazy to go and try to minister out there. You'll have no fruit. You'll bear no, uh-uh. No, uh, uh. But did you know, church, if the church in Denver would get filled up, if our fire would get stoked on the inside, if we would begin to live this thing as if it is for real, that we would get over our consumer-driven mindset, just dipping our toe in the water just a little bit to make ourselves feel good until next Sunday. But we would become disciples of Christ, desperate for the power of the Holy Spirit within our lives each and every day. The word of the Lord will grow mightily and it will prevail. This place will not be a place of darkness. It will be a place of light and deliverance. Amen. That we will see a revival that's been bigger than anything we've ever seen before. I'm telling you, we don't have to live in the confessions that people are saying about our state, but we can rise up, church, and be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said this in Mark 16, 17 through 20, before he left. 
He said, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now some of you are going, okay, wait a minute. I was good with the demons and the tongues and the sick, but you lost me at serpents and drinking anything deadly. Okay, well, you got to go back to the original translation of what this is saying. Basically, Jesus is saying, you will have authority over the enemy. The serpent is the symbol of the devil, okay? He's not calling us to go pick up snakes. Hallelujah. But the good news in that is he has given us power over the enemy, over the serpent. Amen. God said to the devil, back in the garden, he said, you will bruise his hill, but he will crush your head. Come on now. We're called to crush his head, church. <laughs> we will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Mark needs say no more. My prayer for you, church, is that just a spark of you would be lit today. 